Hello. Hi. Uh, may we have your name, please? Hannah Marx. And you were born in? In Germany. And in what year? In 1928. Okay, nice to meet you, Hannah. My name is Mariana Laguna. And our first question is, where did you live when you when the Holocaust started? And what was your life like for your family and other Jewish families before the Holocaust? Uh, I was, like I said, I was born in 1928. And in 1933, Hitler came to power. And right after Hitler came to power, in Germany, the Jews were chosen to be discriminated at. My uh, father had a business, and uh, my grandparents uh, were in business, so uh, they lost a lot of business. And uh, I had two older brothers, and they had a very hard time in school. In 1935, we could not attend any more sports activities, like when, when we, they were going swimming or they played ball or anything like this. The Jewish children were taken out of the classes and uh, could not uh, participate in the sports. And after 35, 36, the uh, children were told not to play with us. And if they did play with us outside on the streets, their parents got punished, or, and it was very hard for the children to grow up. And this is what I experienced. My older brothers, they were already uh, in, uh, in, in a lyceum. My oldest brother was in a lyceum, and he had a very tough time. And the other one, the teachers would not call on them anymore and uh, wouldn't ask them when they raised their hands, they never were asked to give the answers, so it was very hard. In 1938, which I don't know if you ever heard about, was Crystal Night, the breaking of the glass. All the, uh, the stores, like my parents' store, and uh, all the stores in the city were d destroyed, the glasses were broken, the uh, material and anything what was in there was stolen, was thrown out of the stores, and all the houses, the, the SS and the soldiers came to the houses. A lot of people got beaten up, taken out of the homes, and were beaten up. And there were about 3,000 men who were taken away into, the, into prison and into the later on, after a few days, sent to the concentration camp. My brother at the time was 17 years old, and uh, he was taken to prison, but was sent back home after three days because uh, they would not take any men under 18 into the concentration camps. They were not allowed to send them in there. So my father was gone for about, and all the synagogues, the, the temples were destroyed. Either they were burning, and a lot of uh, uh, temples in, Ger in Germany, they were in a courtyard like, and around the courtyard and next door were big buildings or small buildings. So these temples were not set on fire. They took all the material from the the prayer books and the scarves and everything what the Jewish people kept in the synagogue because they couldn't carry anything on Saturdays and they took it all out and burned it on the street and uh, after uh, this was November 9th and the, on the 12th and the 15th the synagogues which were in the courtyards the Jewish people had to go and destroy the buildings so and the whole world stood still, and that Hitler got the, the okay to go and do what he wanted to do with the Jews in Europe. And um, and after that, we had to. I brought some. I uh, we had to uh, have identification cards with a big J as for Jew on there, and we had to wear a star in the front and in the back uh, in order. We, 
that they would know that we are Jewish and that they should not talk to us. They shouldn't, we couldn't go into certain stores to buy anything. So we had a very hard time and we could not attend the schools. And if there were smaller towns where the Jewish children went to school and had Hebrew classes in the afternoon and religious religion in the afternoon, they would go and uh, uh, they could not go back to school. And uh, uh, I and I didn't even realize what was going on. I still went to school on the, the, the 9th of November and my school teacher sent me home and she was Jew friendly. I had been with her from the first grade to the fourth grade and uh, she said uh, she called the police and uh, had an escort, the police escorted me home because most of the kids we were known in the in the city in the town where we lived that we were Jewish and uh, they would beat the kids up and and I was one of the my brothers were beaten up terrible and uh, I was lucky that my teacher was nice enough to send me home with an escort and after that it was really bad living there uh, kids would throw stones us up when, if when we were playing outside or going outside and in 1941, in December, they, uh, a, a couple of weeks before, in December, they sent, the government sent a letter that we should pack a suitcase with warm clothes and a backpack with food for about three, four days. And uh, they would pick us up from our home uh, and send us, into a ghetto. Mm -hmm. uh, they assembled all the Jews in the big city in a, in a gymnasium and we were about a thousand people all together assembled and they put us into trains and sent us to Riga which is Latvia which is uh, very close to Russia. It was in December, it was very cold in Germany, we never had it this cold and didn't give us any drinks or anything and it was pan the panic broke out while we were traveling and in the middle of the, the midnight they uh, stopped the train and uh, after two days and brought some water for the people. Excuse me, yeah. may I ask you to spell Riga please? R-I-G-A. That's the city and Latvia is the uh, country L-A-T-V-I-A. And where you were born in Germany, what city was that? That was Hamm in Westfalen. And may you spell that please? H-A-M-M -M. and Westfalen is the district like Illinois or California. That's W-E-S-T-F-A-L-E-N. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I would, in the Riga ghetto, we were. I was. We were one of the lucky ones. We were not separated the first couple of years. We did. Uh, we did go to work. Uh, the first six months was terrible. When we arrived in Riga, there was the first time that the SS came with leather strips and were beating our people and go fast, get out fast, and the children and the uh, old people who couldn't, we had to go about uh, five kilometers, which is about four and a half miles. We had to uh, uh, walk with our uh, backpack. They took the uh, suitcases, they put on, a, uh, on trucks, and we never saw them. They never came into the ghetto they confiscated them right away. But they were beating the people, whoever did, couldn't go fast enough, they were hitting them. And uh, I was, I just turned 13. So my father and I had two older brothers. They, my father said, we are staying together and you can, we can all walk five uh, kilometers. There is no problem. And when we got into the ghetto, they had, uh, 
the 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 regens the regenza and Latvian Jews were assembled before the German Jews got there. They were assembled in this ghetto and uh, killed all of them. There were about thirty thousand Riga uh, Latvian Jews who were killed before we got there, and they kept about a thousand men who were young men from between 19 and 25 who had already a trade, what they needed to help, and a hundred women. That's all they saved from the Latvian Jews. And when we came into the ghetto, the snow was full of blood. It was just all wet. And I was very innocent and stupid, and I said to my dad, I said, how come the snow is all red outside? It's all white. So he said, well, maybe the kids were playing that they tried to do something. He didn't didn't want to tell me that it was blood. And in the beginning, the first couple of days, I didn't realize until uh, when they mistreated us and were shooting the people, then I knew what was going on, what happened. So you and your family never got separated? Pardon? Did you and your family never got separated? No, we were the first two years we were not. And when they uh, uh, dissolved the ghetto, they put us into the Kaiserwald, into the concentration camp. That's when we all got separated. And where did they go? Uh, well, my father, uh, they had a commando in, in the Kaiserwald, which is a, a wooden area and um, they had to dig the graves and uh, they were uh, at that time already they were gassing they put the people on trucks and let the fume kill the people and they had to uh, uh, put them into the graves and cover them and then the ones who covered them the latvian ss would they had a small hole and they would put the people who covered them up and my father was one of them, he was shot there. That, that I know. My brothers, I had two brothers, I don't know. We were 58 in the family, and we were four people left from the whole family. I, I was very lucky, my mother did survive with me, and uh, I had a, bro uh, a cousin who grew up with me in my same hometown. Uh, my aunt had sent him to at the time Palestine, uh, in with a children transport, they took about a thousand uh, Jewish children, they took to England, and uh, about uh, two, three hundred they took, they could go to uh, Israel and to, to Palestine at the time. And my cousin was one they sent into a kibbutz to Palestine. So, uh, and uh, I know my dad and my brothers. I'm still looking for them. I don't know what happened. I even went to Germany to Arlson where all the papers there are there, and I they gave me the copies, and they say "verschollen," which means disappeared. Not where they were killed or where they went to. Nothing. And all the rest of the family, they were all killed. It, a lot of them in Poland, and a couple of them on the end in Germany. Thank you. My name is Cameron Roberts. Okay. And, uh, I would like, I would like I would wanna, I wanna ask you, what happened to you when the war ended? What happened when the war ended? Yes. Uh, I was in Stuttgart in the concentration camp, and from Stutthof, I was working for a very short time, for the same kind of work I did in Riga. I was working for the ABA, which means we were cleaning and sewing the uh, uni used uniform, which from the soldiers from the front, they send them, we clean them, we repair them, and send them back to the front. And whenever they transported us from uh, Lit from Latvia, we went to Lithuania, and from Lithuania into the concentration camp Stutthof, and they even had a working place there for a very short time, but uh, uh, the Russians came closer to the, to the camp, so they dissolved the camp, and uh, I went for about two and a half months on a death march. 
and uh, we were about five six thousand on the march and uh, when liberation came we were about 300 left uh, we didn't get any food on the death march we lived off from the snow on the ground if it wouldn't have been heavy snow and we would have had to drink nobody would have survived and sometimes the they were storing uh, animal food on the fields, and we didn't care if they would shoot us or not. When we saw the fields where, where, they, where there was uh, food like uh, like kohlrabis and stuff, what they gave the animals, we just ran and took whatever we could and went back. And a lot of them got shot, and whoever was lucky did not. And uh, whenever you didn't feel good or you couldn't get up in the morning, we were usually put into no cover over your head. We were sleeping on the fields at night. And I tell you, if you ask me, if you don't believe me, I do understand it. I went through it and every day I have the question, how could any human being survive this? This still is a puzzle to me. There must be somebody above us who really looked over us, but very few people survived it. And really, the death march for two and a half months was really the worst from all my experience from the camps. And we went through a lot of beatings, and we went through a lot of discomfort and hunger, but the death march is just unbelievable. And people were shot, and we were so cold, we would tear their clothes off and would take the clothes, and it was just bad. And the last day when we were liberated, in the uh, afternoon, the highest of SS officer came to us. He said, we are going to get a big treat tonight. We are going to be undercover. In the little town of Putzig, where I was liberated, was a German was a German little town which was taken over by the officers from the Germans from the Poles, and they had a very comfortable life there during the war, and they had a small airport, and they brought us into one of the hangars at night, the few hundred people who were left. And about this, it was almost dark, but and uh, a couple of German soldiers came in and they asked us that we should get out of the. They didn't know who we were. They asked, "Who are you and why are you here in the Sanger?" And my mother and I spoke a perfect German. Most of the uh, survivors were mostly from Poland. There were about five German survivors and the rest were from Poland or from different parts of the countries. And uh, my mother got up and she said, uh, we are Jews and uh, we are prisoners here. You and we, are, we cannot go out. And he said, there's nobody outside anymore. All the uh, SS and everybody left because the Russians are coming the war, you know, they are fighting outside. So my mother said, no, we are not going. Many times during the prison years, they told us to do something and go there. And when we did, when somebody did that, uh, uh, and we went out, and when we wanted to, as soon as we were outside, they would shoot them for fun. And they would say, well, they, you were deserting us. The, the, you were a deserter, that's why we shot them. So they had all kind, kind of excuses. They just got pleasure out of hurting us at times. Not everybody, but a lot of them. And uh, the soldiers said, yeah, you can save yourself, get out, and you don't speak like a Jew because you speak a perfect German like I speak. And my mom said, I've lived in Germany, and my parents and grandparents, everybody was in the German army in the Third World War I. Uh, we are German Jews, and they did not believe us. The, those young men, they saw the Stürmer, which is a, a propaganda newspaper, and they saw big ears, and you know how it was made up. 
and uh, and one of the boys I call them boys because they were not more than 18 19 year old soldiers and one of the guy they had big pockets with hand grenades and ammunition they were supposed to blow up the airport and us inside they didn't even know we were in there and then um, uh, my mom said, well, you are not going out, you can do with that, you can blow us up, we are going to be killed anyway. So, and then the one guy said, you know, I was raised in church, and I uh, do want to, uh, I'm taught that if I have to fight, I can protect myself, but I'm not allowed to kill innocent people. I will not kill these people. So the other soldier said, well, if you don't want to kill them, I'm not either. So they both went out, and we never saw them again. And about five, six hours later, it was pitch black at, at midnight, just the Russian soldiers opened the, the hangar and uh, liberated us. And I had typhoid fever, and uh, when the uh, Polish Jew, there was a lot of Polish and Russian Jews with us, and they explained to the Russians that I could not get up. I uh, was very sick, and I told my mother already. They carried me into the hangar, and they said, uh, well, if you um, go tomorrow morning, you got to leave me behind. I cannot walk anymore. And uh, they put me into a hospital. And they were still fighting the Germans and the Russian, and a lot of pe uh, people, girls who were liberated had typhoid fever. And even in the hospital, from the splinters coming through the windows, a lot of them got even killed. In, it was in Putzig, Poland. And how did you end up coming to, to America? Um, I was a very lucky girl. I never was separated from my mother. So when we naturally we were in Poland, and while we were in Putzig, we had to uh, hitchhike this train after I got better. I was in a hospital for about six weeks, and then we had to go into Poland because the war was still on. And after the the war was over, naturally we went to our home. We didn't know that all our family was killed. I thought, I knew my dad. I heard that before I was liberated. But everybody, my brothers, we went home to our hometown. We hitchhiked to our hometown. And um, uh, we were very liberated in the Russian zone. and. Uh, uh, my hometown was in the English zone, so we had to go first through American and then through the English zone to get to our home. And when we got to our house, there was nobody left. So we tried to go to Israel. We, I, I really wanted to go to Palestine at the time because looking for my cousin, I knew he might be alive, but they, uh, England would not let take any Jews officially and hitchhiking. A lot of uh, young people uh, were uh, black market taken from the uh, uh, Israeli army to Israel, but they wouldn't take my mother. They would not take anybody unless they were in their early 20s. So I could not go. And then uh, we asked to come uh, uh, to America. I had some friends from before the war uh, who left to America, so we wanted to come to America. And we registered really illegally because we they had given us our house back from what I had in Germany, where I lived in Germany, and uh, uh, we left everything and uh, uh, went to America. And we registered in the American zone and the, with the freighter trains, you know, we had a lot of American soldiers in Germany, and they brought all the food and uh, supplies from the States to, to Germany, and they took the uh, uh, stateless people, they made us stateless, they take, took the survivors, 
in the uh, freighter train uh, the boats and brought us to the United States. That's how I came to the United States. I had met my husband, who was a survivor in Germany, and uh, he went to Hartford, Connecticut, and I came to Chicago, and we got married here in the United States in 1950. I do have five children, and now I have uh, all of them are married to Jewish partners, and I have eight grandchildren and two great grandchildren. And what what brought you to San Diego? The weather. <laughs> we used to live in Chicago. We had a kosher bakery in Chicago, and uh, things got very tough in Chicago. And uh, I had uh, um, rheumatic arthritis, and the weather was not very good. And I always had a dream to live in a warm climate. And first, we wanted to move to Florida. And when we got to Florida, it was very humid and very hot there. And a friend of ours moved to San Diego. And they said, why don't you move to San Diego? So we came to visit here. And as it happened, my father-in-law uh, had a, um, a we went to the cottage of Israel in Balboa Park, and we met this German Jewish man in the cottage of Israel, and he was from the same hometown that my father-in-law came. And he said, if you want to move to San Diego, I'll help you. Your father-in-law was a best friend of mine. So that's how we ended up in San Diego. Thank you. So there was a very... We were, we were, I think we were very. Hi. My name is Jose Fernandez. Jose. And um, my question is um, as a Holocaust survivor, how has this affected your life and that of your family? How does it affect your day by day decisions or how it does have it impacted your children and grandchildren that you were in the Holocaust? Well, when we, when we lived in Chicago and I bore my children, we were working very hard in order to have to what we have today. Uh, my husband, we, we opened up a very small bakery. I had already a baby for one year old and we started in Oak Park. Uh, my husband was a baker and I was the sales girl and uh, we bought it. And there was a Swedish woman, she had a little boy just my son's age, a year old. She used to pick him up and uh, take him to the park and let the kids play together. And I g we gave him bread and cake, whatever she wanted. So that worked out very well for, for a few years. In fact, it, we had an incident which I'm not very happy and proud of. Uh, Oak Park was a very Polish area, very anti-Semitic, and when we bought that place, the little bakery, we did not know this. We were here in this country for two or three years, and um, like I said, we had a dishwasher, a, a, college, a colored boy who was already in college, which was in the 1950, very seldom in Chicago and he was in college and the the grandfather uh, was delivering our merchandise for baking the flour and stuff and that's how we got him as a dishwasher he washed the pots and pans and did everything and um, uh, one day this little boy from the woman who took him okay so uh, I, when he came, his name was Chuck, and I said to Chuck, I said, would you do me a great favor? My little boy hadn't been outside at all. Would you take him for half an hour to the park? We'll pay you extra, and then you can do the work in the bakery, what you need to do. And he was happy to. And my little boy really liked him a lot. He loved that guy. So 10 minutes later, the police came with my little boy and with Chuck, and he said, is this your little boy? I said, yes. He said, and who is this young man? He sa I told him that he was our helper and the dishwasher, you know, he washed all the stuff and cleaned the bakery, and he was doing me a big favor of taking him out. So 
to, to get some fresh air. And he said, don't you know that colored people are not allowed in the park here and they are not supposed to have white children? So, and you know, I said to the policeman, I said, I cannot believe, I said, I'm a survivor and we were so discriminated in Europe. How I came to a free country and I couldn't believe that that would happen right here in this country. But thank God things have changed in the meantime. So uh, uh, I have five children and they all went to college. They have a very good college education. I never had that chance. I went in camp and I was four years in a concentration camp so I could never go to college and when we came here my mother came with me and she I was 17 years old and she said you are too big and too strong you don't need to go to school you have to and we didn't have nothing we came with five dollars so uh, I had to go to work and I never had the education I did go to evening school. I worked during the day. I learned English and went to evening school. And I read a lot, and, but I never did have a college or high school education. I was a very good scholar when I was in grammar school. And my mother really worked a lot with me to know what I know today. So and all my kids graduated Berkeley and uh, at Chicago, Illinois, the schools and UCLA, so I'm very proud of them. And my grandchildren, one is in Purdue today and is graduating this summer and one is in Cornell, so all my grandchildren have very, very good education and I think we are an asset to this country. We, I always say, you know, our soldiers who are coming from Vietnam and from any place else, we had a very, very tough life. But it never let us get us down. And I'm 83 years today. And the will to live, and I think made us so much stronger while I was in camp, and I never complained. I always worked hard, and I was always good to people, and it comes back to you. And I go to the schools and I tell the kids in school, don't let anything depress you. If you are even discriminated, show them that you are better than they are. You know, you got to be good and uh, show your neighborly instinct. You can live together if you want to, and if you show them that you, if somebody, like if they say something to you, ignore it. And if you ignore it, they will respect you afterwards because you are smarter than the ones who do the hate crimes. I had in Germany when I was little, and we were very orthodox. I came from a very uh, Jewish orthodox family, but my parents were very open. My best girlfriend was a Catholic girl, and I went to midnight mess on Christmas Eve. There was not a Christmas Eve when I was little that I wouldn't go to church with her. My parents would let me go. They had Holy Communion. My mother bought a white dress so I could go and be in a Holy Communion with her. And my, we only ate kosher food. My mother had packages, brought it over to my girlfriend's house. So in, when she came to us, she could eat everything what we ate, but I could not eat what they, like pork or anything, you know, certain food I would not be able to eat. But I never felt different because they, my parents and they were prepared. And she had a brother who was a Hitler youth, and she squealed on her, his, he squealed on his parents because they weren't supposed to go to certain masses anymore. The Catholics had the same, they started the same problem. 
So, you know, some of these kids, even she was discriminated at sometimes. That's what Hitler did. And he was in the Hitler Youth, and they sent him to Arnsberg. They were uh, uh, marching in, in groups and uh, singing Hitler songs and all, and making them tough. And uh, he uh, hurt his foot on the back from his boots or the shoes, whatever he had on. And uh, when he came back over the weekend, they had a four-day uh, weekend, and he was afraid to report that he had an infected foot. And he, when he came back, the, the line was up to here, a red line. He had blood poisoning, and he died of the blood poisoning. So... Uh, and his dad came to my father and he said, I don't know if God was good to us or not because uh, uh, he squealed on us and he reported things which should have never come out of our house. So, and when we came back, my girlfriend still had the picture on her, on my night, on her nightstand when I was a little girl. And those pic that picture, that's the only picture I had for myself. Everything was destroyed. But then I, my cousin in Israel had some pictures. I do have some pictures. I think so. Thank you very much. You're very thank welcome. Thank you for saying that you were here. And thank you. So wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank so. You. Can we take a picture of that? And if you want to, I bought some identification cards and stuff. Maybe you would be what we had to have in Germany. Uh, I don't think you can.